1978, Sartre, France. A group of California race car drivers team up to compete in the famous 24 Hours of Le Mans, the Grand Prix of endurance and efficiency. Though they did not realize it at the time, this will be one of the most intense battles in the Le Mans 91 year history. Endured by the Amdahl Kramer Porsche team, consisted of three American drivers Jim Busby, Chris Cord, and Rick Lee. Without a doubt, Le Mans is the most important motorsport race in the world with over 300,000 people in attendance. This is the Super Bowl, the World Series, the Olympic Games of motorsport. The 1978 Le Mans 24 hour race was a highly anticipated event. Fans, manufacturers, and the media were eager to see their favorite high performance vehicles come away with the first place trophy. This race pitted the Alpine teams against the Renault teams, a race that still lives in many fans' memories to this day. The American team of Busby, Cord, and Newt would run their Crimer Porsche 935 in Group 5, one class below the extremely powerful engines of Group 6. The event itself was commissioned in the summer of May 1923 in Sartre, France. It was initially funded by investor Emile Coquillo and endorsed by the Automobile Club West. Board member George Durand had first suggested that the race be run over a course of 24 hours. And so, the first 24-hour Le Mans race was a huge success. Beginning in 1923, it is one of the oldest car race competitions in the world and held every year since with the exceptions of the 1936 workers' strike drama and from 1940 to 1948 during the World War II era. Shortly after the war, all of the guys that came back on the GI Bill decided to build cars that, that they learned about these, these cars in England. They'd take a 32 Ford, take the fenders off and try to make it like a European sports car. They'd do it in the Bonneville Salt Flats, El Mirage, everywhere they could run them drag race in the streets, and they'd all congregate at the Passy Green Body Shop. Well, I went to work there as a paint prep kid, sanding cars, and I got to see all these hot rods, and it was really something that if I tried, I could do. So I bought a 32 Ford with my Star newspaper route money for $70. I'd go home and build my dragster at night and go to the drags and then come back and work on these sports car engines. And uh, so I was driving, I was building, I was fabricating, I was doing engines and making lots of friends. Ultimately, I had built several 935 race cars for clients here in America and one for Hal Shaw. And he said, Jim, drive it at Daytona with me. I said, okay, but you don't have a factory supported engine, so we're not gonna be that competitive. But I'll go, I'll do that. So about halfway through the race, I'm standing in the pit lane, we're running mid-pack. Erwin Kramer of the Kramer Brothers walks up to me and he said, Jim, you know, would you like to come to Le Mans with us? And I said, you know, Erwin, I really race hard and, and I would like to go to Le Mans more than you could ever imagine, but it's a dangerous race, it's a fast race car, and I want a chance to win. Why don't we get a sponsor and why don't we bring a couple of good American guys along with me? And they said, who? And I said, I don't know. Let me think about that for a minute. We had built a car for Rick Noob, Steve Earle, and Bob Aiken to run at Sebring and so on and so forth. So November of 1977, I drove from USC to Busby Racing and introduced myself. And I said, by the way, my name's Rick Noob. I'm going to be driving car number 32 that you're preparing. Well, it turns out I see him race and he's pretty damn good and mostly he brings it back. So a lot of young guys go out and run hard and they rubbish the car or they crash it. He didn't. He always brought it back in one piece and it was better every lap and he always got better and I was quite impressed. I watched him carefully and then I hooked him up with a guy named Howard Meister who had a GTO Porsche and Rick did well, won races and did really well. So I'm standing there and I'm talking to Fred New, Rick's dad. And I said, do you think Rick would like to go 
to Le Mans. And Fred's eyes got as big as saucers. And uh, he said, well, how would that work? And I said, well, here's what we need to do. We need two drivers over here and we need to go round up some money to replace the guys from Europe who would rather have Rick with me. And, and, and he said, what about Chris Gord? And I said, Chris Gord's really fast. Yes, absolutely. So I had met the, Fred Noop and Rick Noop and I knew Chris. Chris was quick and a great race driver. It was back in 1977, I guess, when Jim Busby and myself and Rick Noop were racing in the uh, IMSA Sports Car Series around the United States. And I had known uh, Rick Noop uh, growing up, basically, uh, in many earlier years through vintage racing. And then Jim put together this whole idea, let's go to Le Mans, as a result of talking to the Kremer brothers. So I get a call one day from, from Jim, and he said, how would you like to, you know, experience Le Mans? And I said, well, yeah, it would be fantastic. And then within a couple of days, Rick called me and said, well, listen, I think the three of us would be a great team, and it was just an opportunity of a lifetime. We just couldn't say no. So I call the boys and I say, guys, we're going to Le Mans. And Rick, of course, is now double squirrely and coming to my shop every three hours instead of every five. And running around in circles and we're building cars and so on. He, he just can't stop talking. I was always intrigued with it. The Ferrari and the Ford wars, the battles, the GT40s against Enzo's red Ferraris. I absolutely adored it. I couldn't sleep for months prior to it. It was an all-American team. My God, if we didn't win our category. The flag is down, and all the drivers are quickly out of their cars. The more powerful cars will try to get away first, so it's not The Le Mans 24 hours consisted of at least three drivers taking turns at the wheel during the more than 5,000 kilometer distance over a 24-hour period. The American drivers were not necessarily recognized as highly as some of the European drivers. And I think we felt that we could demonstrate that we could compete on the same platform as, as the Europeans and be competitive and really kind of show that we were as professional as they were. And I think that was one of the things that excited me about going to Le Mans with Rick and and Jim, and, and by darn we, you know, we, we held our own and, and more than that. Phil Hill was at that race that we were competing in in 1978, and he was very, very helpful to myself and to Rick and to Jim in terms of how to approach the Le Mans race because he'd won it like six times back in the 1950s and 60s. And so he, his, his presence gave us a a boost of confidence. So he was the guy that you know we all looked up to in terms of an American who had achieved amazing results at Le Mans. And he happened to be there that year, so it was hugely helpful for us. It was also Dan Gurney, and Dan was a, an iconic American driver, as, as we all know, and he drove for Ferrari there, I think, back in the late 50s, early 60s. There's the checkered flag. It's an all-American win. The veteran Dan Gurney from California. In its 91 years in motorsports racing history, this endurance race competition has boasted some of the most entertaining and dramatic victories, triumphs and tragedies. With the high speeds associated with Le Mans, the track has seen a number of accidents some of which have been fatal to drivers and spectators. So now we've started on the Mulsanne Strait. This is the real straight, although there's a teeth at each end. And this is where the speeds really go up, over 150 miles an hour now, and we're not even flat out yet. And yet you can see the way the white lines flash. And when you go down the Mulsanne Strait at 230 miles an hour, and you're on the throttle so hard for so long that your right foot goes to sleep on the throttle, and you have to take your left foot and shove it under your right foot and hold the throttle down with your left foot and wiggle your toes to get blood back, and you got time to do that? 
And while you're doing that, you're going through a 220 mile an hour right hand corner, flat without lifting, in top gear. That's fast. Bucknam leads the pack down Molson Street. From above, you can see the Fords accelerating up to 220 miles per hour down the 3.6 mile straightaway. So remarkably fast, they soon move out of range of the camera helicopter. And there's a dog leg turn, a kink, right? You say right about in the middle of the, of the straightaway. And at night, you can't see you're going at about 200 miles an hour, maybe 190. And so in order to make the kink, make that turn for it, you have to kind of find something on a guardrail or say, you know, some identifying mark and, and say, okay, I'm there, now turn. And then hope your, your lights open up and shine on that part of the road that makes that right-hand turn. If you miss it, your history. We start the race. I'm driving. I said to the Kramer brothers, do you want me to turn the boost up? And No, don't touch anything. Go out and do it. Just go drive as hard as you can to qualify. So I don't know it, but they've lowered the car down to where it'll hardly get off the ground. And they've turned the boost up mechanically instead of on the knob on the dash. I take off in this thing, and it is so fast that it's like another car. And I'm hustling down the Mulsanne straight, and I'm running out of gear before the kink in this thing going like 232. I've never been in a faster racing car on a longer straight. I'm following John Fitzpatrick, who'd qualified one, I was two. And I notice that he's got a lot of flames out of his tailpipe. Now we're in, going into a 24 hour race. And I'm thinking, you're burning a lot of fuel in that car. That means they get the boost turned up. What, what are they doing early in the race? I mean, you gotta be insane. I stay with Fitzpatrick and I don't see anybody in my mirrors. So we're doing pretty well. And, and all at once I see oil starting to land on my windshield and more smoke and more flames out of the back end of Fitzpatrick's car. They've killed the motor. And we come out of the Mulsanne corner and he pulls off the side of the road with smoke out the back of his motor and I go whistling by into the lead. Boy, Lady Luck was on our side. There was some horrific happenings there because those were the days when there was no chicane. The straightaway was 3.8 miles with 700 horsepower and um, open face helmets and that's the way it was back then. So we were careful, yet uh, we were in the hunt so all 24 hours. Not for 24 minutes we were in the hunt. We were, we were on the board for 24 hours. And there's an enormous accident in the night. Chris is in the car. The car in front of him with Bob Gerritsen turns in about, I'm going to say, 20 yards before the kink. Missed the, missed the kink on the inside, got turned too soon, got in the dirt, came across the track, hit the guardrail, launched the car probably uh, 200 feet in the air and it started barrel rolling and all I could see was this turbo going round and round and round and it came right down in front of me and the car totally disintegrated on the racetrack. I thought, this guy's dead. There's no way you could survive that. It was just, there were engines, parts, body pieces all over the racetrack. And, you know, that was a yellow flag condition and we, it took them maybe a half hour to clean that whole up, thing up. But, Miraculously, the driver survived. I don't know how it happened, but and I thought, okay, this, this is scary as heck. They don't stop the race, but they direct it around the accident for about an hour. And the Kramer brothers are smart enough to say, stay out, stay out, stay out. Don't come in and pit. Just stay out. Just collect laps. Keep laps going. Which was a good thing, because at the end of the race, we did burn an exhaust valve, and we could bring it, we could nurse it home for the last hour, and we ended up winning no matter what it took was to keep putting laps on. Come in for fuel, driver change, get back out there. We were very disciplined with the Kramer brothers. They, they kept an eye on us and we had a very, very tight structure within them to run. Driving with a, a diverse group of great drivers that did this as a, as a career, the speeds were so high. And, and so that you know created a dynamic of danger that during the rest of my racing career, we just never really saw that level. So going there, enjoying it, succeeding, and being able to walk away and have memories is about as good as it gets. It was a gift to have this opportunity happen, and we ran with Marine Corps discipline. This is one of the most dangerous things I've ever done in terms of, of being on a racetrack. 
Gosh, I can still see the Martini livery 936 going by me, looking in the rearview mirror and thinking going 200 is pretty fast on a crown road, and then all of a sudden you look in the rearview mirror and boom, boom, there's someone going by you. Holy cow, you know. And, and having that person trust you because you were staying on your specific part of the track. And there's guys like Ix, Yock and Moss, all the guys that were my heroes. And here's Chris Kaur, Jim Busby and myself. And we were being gentlemen, but we were getting with it. And the guys, when they would come by about every 20 minutes, let's say, because they were fast, they were in the 230 to 240 zone. Our relaxed boost pressure to save the motor, I would say we were probably 190 maybe. And they would go by like, it'd be like walking out the street right now and a bus goes by at 40 miles an hour. It really grabbed me. And my favorite memories would have to be watching those group six cars go by me. I came through the last little set of chicanes and the gendarmes, they just said suck le bleu and everybody unloaded. It, it was like a tsunami. And I was, you know, we were just, we couldn't believe it. We had done it. I could believe it because it was a great grouping of drivers. The consistency was there. We could still pull the lap times out of the Kramer archives. And I'm very proud to say that we all complimented each other. We didn't wall it up on the third lap. There wasn't a lot of car left, I have to tell you, mechanically. We were going through quite a bit of oil because we had dropped a valve and we were pouring almost as much oil in it as fuel. It's still very fresh in my mind, even though it's been 36 years ago. I was 24 and Chris and Jim, I guess, were 35 then. So we were all young guys with a common goal. And boy, did it work. And at the end of the race, when we won, Erwin Kramer came up to me with tears in his eyes and in perfect English said, Jimmy, you make me very, very happy. And then we went home and the Kramer brothers became friends of mine forever. And Bill and Don Whittington, as a result of doing business with our workshop, that built their 935s and raced them for them, uh, put this deal together. So really the Kramer brothers, and I'm proud to say I had something to do with both cars, um, basically won two years in a row uh, with their 935s, and they had never done that before. They'd never won. Class, overall, nothing. And this car won overall. I'm really proud. To have this car come home to roost in Southern California with Bruce, my old time buddy, and there's a lot of history that goes back to Southern California drag racing and winds up in the winner's circle at Le Mans. It was just one of those experiences that you know, as a person who loved driving race cars, had to have that in your in your resume. Say you've done it, say you could talk about it, and being the greatest uh, road race in the world. When I was about seven years old, my father ran Pebble Beach in 56. He had built a car and I used to sneak out of bed and go down to the garage and look at it, and it was a Devon body car, a special. I wanted racing so bad I couldn't see straight. And to put together an opportunity in my wildest dreams to drive at Le Mans, with Jim and Chris have a world audience. To this day, it's one of the most special and cherished moments of my life. When I think about it, I think about it in the present. I was amazed to be there. I could not believe that the three of us were there. But in retrospect, one of the most fun things to me is, is that your dad had loved racing and was in racing, and you sort of came along mm -hmm. and did that. Rick's dad was in racing and, and did it, and you guys are around it forever. My parents couldn't have cared less about racing. <laughs> However, my uncle Harry Steele had a Cat Allard, and he raced it right at, at Torrey Pines and, yep. and Pebble Beach, and his name's in the record books. Huh. And I idolized the guy. And now as you turn around and look back at it, and you say, how did all of the pieces go together that put three guys that went to school in the Ojai Valley for all intents and purposes, that loved cars, that came from different backgrounds, with family members that sort of ginned them up to this mm -hmm. passion for Le Mans, and we wound up there together yeah. Yeah. and won. And we were, yeah, and won.